Okay guys, so we're going to start chapter 1 with uh, type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes results when the individual produces very little or no endogenous, endo meaning within, uh, genus insulin to carry glucose into the cells. In case you're wondering which organ produces insulin, the answer to that question is the pancreas. And so when the pancreas is not producing insulin, that results in hyperglycemia. And I'll show you how. So 98% of your body operates on these things called negative feedback loops. Um, and what happens is, in the negative feedback loop for blood sugars, an elevated blood sugar will cause the pancreas to release insulin. The insulin will counteract the blood sugar, and that will cause the blood sugar levels to drop. The drop in blood sugar will then cause the cells in the pancreas to cease production and the release of insulin. And then blood sugar will again begin to rise, which kickstarts this loop all over again. So this is a continuous loop. It happens 24-7 your entire life. So in patients with type 1 diabetes, there's an interruption or a break in this loop right here, and the pancreas does not release insulin. Thus, the patients end up with something called hyperglycemia. When there's no insulin being produced by the pancreas, there's, uh, excuse me, released by the pancreas, then there's nothing there to counteract the rise in blood sugar. And then they end up with too much or hyper uh, amounts of blood sugar. And that's where we get the term hyperglycemia. So when that happens, the patients must take ecto or something that comes from outside of the body, ectogenous insulin, um, or they could take exogenous. So ecto would be a pump, an, an insulin pump, where that is implanted into um, the body, or exo would be via injections. So a lot of people start out with injections before they're approved for pumps. Sometimes it takes a, quite a bit of time before a patient can get approved for an insulin pump. So the symptoms of diabetes that you need to be aware of, there's urination, and these are the med terms that you need to be um, knowledgeable about when it comes to diabetic symptoms. So you have polyuria, that means frequent urination. You have polydipsia, which is excessive thirst um, or frequent thirst. You have polyphagia, which is excessive or frequent hunger. So there's some other symptoms over here on the um, picture for you to look at. Usually diabetic symptoms involve um, being always tired, frequent urination, uh, sudden weight loss, Oftentimes, diabetic patients will have wounds that do not heal. They have sexual problems. Um, they tend to always be hungry. Sometimes they have blurry vision. They will have numb or tingling hands or feet. Frequently, they are thirsty. Um, and a lot of times, they will have vaginal infections. Um, and that's usually due to a misbalance of pH. Okay, so type one is um, the uh, has these characteristics that you need to be aware of. So these characteristics involve being exogenous insulin dependent, which means that they are dependent on insulin that is produced outside of the body, whether that be um, delivered through a pump or through injections. They are exogenous insulin dependent. Type one diabetes um, usually has an onset in youth. That's the type that we see most common in uh, youth onsets. Tendency to have ketoacidosis. So what happens with ketoacidosis is the blood sugars are uncontrolled and you, it causes a rise in ketones and that causes the blood to become acidic, which causes organs to shut down. Ketoacidosis or diabetic ketoacidosis, that's what DKA stands for here, um, is a life-threatening condition and it can lead to coma or death if it's left untreated. The scary thing about DKA is that it can develop within 24 hours and a lot of times people will ignore their symptoms um, and so it progresses very rapidly and uh, needs to be treated immediately if a patient suspects that they have ketoacidosis. Type 1 can also occur on an autoimmune basis. So we usually don't see autoimmune um, associations with youth onset diabetes type 1. We do see them sometimes with adults though. Adults will have autoimmune diseases and basically that's where the immune system destroys the cells that produce insulin 
um, which then do not allow the pancreas to release insulin. So then they would need to be insulin dependent as well. And then some people have a genetic disposition to inherit or develop type 1 diabetes. So the second type is diabetes of diabetes is type 2. And characteristics of type 2 includes being non-insulin dependent, so they do not typically have to take insulin um, from exogenous sources. It usually uh, onsets in adults that are over age 40, usually middle age. Middle age can, is kind of um, defined by regions, but uh, in the United States it's somewhere between the age of 40 and um, 50. Some endogenous insulin production is um, present in these type 2 patients, so they do have some insulin production. Oftentimes it's just not a sufficient amount to regulate their blood sugars. Type 2 is often caused by obesity um, or abnormal weight gains, um, and it can be treated with diet or uh, oral hypoglycemic agents. So um, I have a little video here. I'm going to see if this works. And if it does, it will show you how um, type 2 diabetes works. So let me see. Understanding type 2 diabetes. Understanding type 2 diabetes. Understanding type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder that causes sugar in the form of glucose. Understanding type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder that causes sugar in the form of glucose to accumulate in the blood rather than being used as fuel by the cells in our body. When we eat, food is broken down by our digestive system into nutrient molecules that are then absorbed through our digestive tract for use by the body. Foods containing carbohydrates or various sugars are broken down into glucose. Glucose is an important source of fuel for many organs in our body. However, to be able to use the glucose for fuel, the glucose molecule must first enter into the cell. The pancreas produces a hormone called insulin, a chemical messenger essential for the entry of glucose into cells. As the blood glucose levels rise after a meal, insulin is released into the bloodstream and sets processes in motion to trigger the removal of glucose from the blood to enter into the cells. In type 2 diabetes, the cells become resistant to insulin and ignore its message to absorb glucose. This is known as insulin resistance. In addition, in type 2 diabetes, the pancreas is unable to produce the greater amounts of insulin needed to trigger these resistant cells to take in glucose from the bloodstream. The most notable symptom of diabetes is frequent urination and excessive thirst. Other symptoms include weakness, drowsiness, and blurred vision. These are caused by chemical imbalances in the blood related to high levels of blood glucose. About one in four people with type 2 diabetes are unaware that they have the disease. It is important to catch diabetes early. Over time, high blood glucose damages the blood vessels, which can damage the organs that these vessels supply, leading to a variety of health complications. Damage to the small or micro blood vessels can cause vision problems, including loss of sight, nerve damage, and kidney disease. Damage to larger or macro blood vessels can lead to cardiovascular complications such as heart disease, stroke, and poor blood circulation. Overweight and inactivity are major causes of diabetes. A family history of diabetes significantly increases your risk of developing the disease. Certain ethnic populations are also at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Finally, some medications may increase your diabetes risk, specifically corticosteroids, thiazide diuretics, drugs used to treat certain mental illnesses, 
and some antiretrovirals used to treat HIV infection. In summary, type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder. It causes sugar, in the form of glucose, to accumulate in the blood, rather than being used as fuel for the cells in our body. If not diagnosed All right. in a timely manner, so, type 2 diabetes um, there's a third type of diabetes that happens only in pregnant women, and that's called gestational diabetes. Uh, characteristics include um, that it occurs in individuals not previously diabetic. Obviously, men cannot get gest gestational diabetes because uh, they do not get pregnant, but gestational diabetes will happen in women who were not diabetic prior to pregnancy. So they are only diabetic during their um, gestational period or during their pregnancy. They develop hyperglycemia, so their blood sugars are too high during their pregnancy. And this could progress to diabetes mellitus, or it could return to normal glucose levels postpartum. Um, for the most part, uh, it will return to normal glucose levels after the baby is born, but some women do go on to develop um, postpartum full-blown diabetes. So there is that risk if uh, a woman develops gestational diabetes during her pregnancy that she will continue to battle diabetes postpartum as well. Okay, so grab your phones, uh, laptops, tablets, whatever you have to log on to Socrative with and log on to the classroom and we'll do a quick review of what we've covered over diabetes so far. Okay, so terms with lapro. Lapro is the combining form for abdominal wall. So a laparectomy would be an excision of part of the abdominal wall. A laparoscopy would be the process of examining the abdominal wall. And then a laparoscope would be an instrument for examining the abdominal wall or an instrument used for viewing the abdominal wall. And so the picture here shows you um, what a laparoscope would look like. You can see they're quite long. Um, sometimes they are adjustable. And so they can go through uh, smaller or larger abdominal walls if necessary. So some laparoscopic procedures that you should be aware of. A laparoscopically assisted vaginal hysterectomy is the removal of a uterus through the vagina looking through a laparoscope. And I'm gonna show you a video of that in just a second. Don't freak out, it's not graphic. Uh, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the removal of the gall gallbladder with assistance of a laparoscope. And so it shows you a picture here of the gallbladder removal. And so they go in with a laparoscope and locate the gallbladder, and um, then they go in and remove that. Oop. Okay, so the laparoscopy and hysterectomy, I'll show you this really quickly. It's kind of cool how they do it. Um, if you're into this kind of thing, I happen to be into this kind of thing, so I thought maybe I'd show you a quick video. A hysterectomy is a surgical removal of the uterus. For certain conditions, it may also include the removal of the cervix, ovaries, malignant tubes, and other surrounding structures. There are four ways to perform a hysterectomy surgery. Abdominal hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy, laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, and natural orifice transvaginal endoscopic surgery. During this procedure, the surgeon will create several small incisions called pores into the abdomen. After the carbon dioxide gas pumped into the abdomen for better visualization of the contents, the laparoscope and other surgical instruments are then inserted into the pores. Under the guidance of the laparoscope, the uterus is dissected from the ligaments and tissues. After the dissection is completed, the uterus is then detached and removed through the vagina. Finally, the surgeon will remove the chuckle sleeves and surgical instruments of the ports and close the incisions with stitches.
Lastly, close up the vaginal opening with stitches. The surgery is now completed. All right, good times there. Uh, moving on to terms with pyro. Pyro is the combining form for words to mean heat, fever, or fire. So anything that means heat, fever, or fire, we can use the combining form pyro for. Examples include pyrophobia, which is an abnormal fear of fire, pyromaniac, which is one who has an excessive preoccupation for starting or seeing fires. That's never a good thing. Pyrosis, which is a condition of heartburn. Um, pyrotoxin, which is a poison produced by high body temperatures. Hyperpyrexia is the condition of high fever. It's usually a fever that is higher than 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, anything below 102 is just uh, a typical fever. Pyrolysis is a destruction of fever. Pyrometer is an instrument that is used for measuring heat, um, more commonly known as a thermometer. Uh, hydro is the combining form for sweat. You have hydrosis, which is a condition of sweating, hyperhidrosis, which is profuse sweating, hydrorrhea, which is the flow of sweat, anhydrosis, which is the absence of sweat, hydronitis, which is an inflammation of sweat glands, and there is a picture here for you to show you what hydronitis uh, looks like. Sugar is our next uh, topic. We have glyco and gluco. Those are the terms for sugar. Some examples include glycogenesis and glucogenesis. Those both indicate the formation of sugar. Glycoprotein and glucoprotein are substances made of sugar and proteins. Glycosuria and glucosuria indicate sugar in the urine. And then lastly, glyco glycohemoglobin um, is sugar and hemoglobin. The abbreviation for that is usually HGbA1c or uh, more commonly you'll see it as just A1C because it is commonly known that HGB is part of the A1C, so um, you can see those either way. So there's a little graphic here for you at the bottom that show you the normal ranges for the um, glycohemoglobin test. A normal um, A1C rate would be down here, pre-diabetic would be between 5.6% and 6.5%. And then anybody with an A1C over 6.5% would be considered diabetic. So normal range would be anything under 5.5%. Okay, glycogen is a starch formed from simple sugars that is um, then stored as reserve fuel. Glycogenesis is the formation of glycogen from carbohydrates. So what happens here is the body converts glycogen to glucose and then the cells uh, use that to release energy. So people um, go on these really low carb diets, but you actually need carbs to um, create energy for your body and for your cells to use. The problem is we eat and consume way more carbs than we actually need in order to keep our body energized. And so that's where we run into issues. Glycolysis is the breakdown um, to glycogen or excuse me, of glycogen to glucose. Glycorrhea is a discharge of sugars from the body. This usually happens in urine. Um, you'll see that when you guys go through lab classes, you'll probably end up doing your urine dips in clinical, and you will find that one of the urine dip tests um, tests for uh, glucose in the urine, and that's what we're looking for. The body um, will filter out ex excess glucose into the, uh, through the kidneys and out into the urine. Glycemia is sugar in the blood. Hyperglycemia is the high level of sugar in the blood, and this is a symptom of diabetes. And then you have hypoglycemia, which is low levels of blood sugar. And this can occur if a person produces too much insulin. So if they have too much insulin, then there's going to be too much counteracting the rise of blood sugar, and that's going to cause them to have low levels of blood sugar.
Okay, so moving on to immunology. Immunity is one of the body's defenses against disease. Immuno is the combining form for that. Uh, for example here, immunology would be the study of the function of the immune system. So basically your immune system is kind of like your um, defense system, your army, if you will, of um, special groups of cells that fight off all of the viruses, infections, fungus, bacteria, um, pollutants, cancer cells, all of the stuff that tries to get into your body that does not belong there, your immune system will go then and try to fight all of those things off. So you have three types of immunity. You have natural immunity, and that's part of your physiology. And then you have natural passive, and that's what happens when the mother passes her immunity on to the fetus during pregnancy or to the infant through breastfeeding. And so that's one of the reasons why we strongly advocate for breastfeeding is because breastfeeding helps with that natural passive immunity and it helps boost the baby's immune system. So the baby's getting it from pregnancy from the mom, during pregnancy from the mom, and then again through breastfeeding as well. And then lastly, we have artificial immunity, and that's scientifically designed immunity, and those include things like um, vaccinations or immunizations. Okay, so in regards to this artificial immunity, there are two types. There's passive, um, and those include immunoglobulin injections, and those are given to boost the immune response. So basically what we're doing is giving um, some extra help to the immune system to help boost it up and help it um, perform a little bit better. And then we have active artificial immu immunity, and those are vaccines that contain specific antigens that then will stimulate lymphatic systems to the lymphatic system to produce matching antibodies. And so with these vaccinations, usually it's something called an attenuated virus, which is a weakened version of a virus. And uh, so we'll introduce this virus in the form of a vaccine. It will cause the immune system to form a reaction to this weakened version of this virus um, so that you build up immunity without necessarily getting sick or getting the disease. Immunotherapy includes immunizations, and those are injections that stimulate the immune response also known as vaccinations. There are 11 uh, recommended vaccinations before age seven for the general population. I will tell you that um, vaccination advocacy is a big deal for me. I um, think vaccinations are incredibly important. Not only are they important for your children, but they are important for adults as well. And you as healthcare professionals should be aware that there is an additional immunization schedule for those who are working within healthcare. So that's definitely something you want to check with the CDC's website on um, so you can make sure that you are, uh, you know, accurately protected or excuse me, adequately protected. Um, before you go out and start working with, you know, a sick population. Okay, so the immune response is the production of antibodies by lymphocytes, and they, uh, these lymphocytes then go and disable antigens, and antigens are disease-causing um, organisms. Your antibodies will hook up with these antigens and try to eat them, um, and, and by eating them, they kind of destroy them. An antigen is any foreign substances, again, that invades the body and causes disease. An immunodeficiency pertains to deficient immune system that is unable to fight off disease. And we see one of the most common things um, or commonly heard of immunodeficiency diseases is that of HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus. HIV causes AIDS, which is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And what happens with HIV um, is that this uh, virus, the HIV virus, attacks the helper T cells, which are a very specific type of uh, lymphocyte that fights off and kills viruses. And once they um, have killed a certain number of T cells, then um, the patient becomes AIDS positive. 
instead of just HIV positive, they they then transition over to becoming uh, or into being AIDS patients, going from HIV positive to AIDS patients. So um, these the thing is, is a specific type of cell that um, this HIV virus kills does not replenish itself uh, and not in a sufficient manner to keep up with the virus that's killing it. So we have lots of other cells that we can reproduce at rapid speed, red blood cells, um, other types of white blood cells that we can reproduce so that um, if, as our body is injured or things are introduced to our body that aren't supposed to be there, they can keep up with these infections and kind of try to fight them off. But this specific type of cell the HIV targets um, can't keep up. It's a very specialized type of cell. It takes a long time for that type of cell to develop and grow into the type of cell that it is. And because of that, um, it, you know, the HIV virus overruns the immune system very quickly. All right, moving on to terms with auto. Auto is the combining form for self. Examples include autonomic, which is self-controlling, autodiagnosis, which is diagnosing one's own diseases. You'll see that a lot. Autophobia, which is an abnormal fear of being alone. And auto, uh, excuse me, autolysis, which is self-destruction. Uh, Autoimmunity is the condition when the body produces antibodies to its own tissue. So that then results in autoimmune disorders. Things like RA or rheumatoid arthritis and lupus erythematosus, um, more commonly known just as lupus, those are autoimmune disorders. And so basically what happens is the immune system sees the body's own tissues as foreign substances or invaders and then produces an antibody um, to that or an immune response to that and goes and attacks the body's own tissues. So it no longer recognizes your body's own tissues as itself and instead um, believes them to be invaders and tries to destroy them as it would any other invader. Autologous and autogenous um, are adjectives meaning originating in itself or coming from one's own body. An autologous blood transfusion is a transfusion with one's own blood drawn before having surgery. And we see this a lot with patients. Um, a patient will have go in and donate blood so that it is available during their surgery. So that way, um, if, if there's a significant blood loss during the procedure, the surgeon or the hospital will not have to rely on blood bank surgery, or excuse me, blood bank um, blood. They will be able to inf infuse the patient or to um, hang bags of the patient's own blood to then transfuse them with their own blood. Autohemotherapy is therapy with one's own blood. An autograft is a skin graft using one's own healthy skin. You see that a lot too in burn patients. If a burn patient has a burn over a specific portion of their body, say the arm, then they may graft skin from the buttocks or the thigh and graft it onto the burn on the arm. And then lastly, autoplasty is a surgery using grafts from one's own body. All right, let's check in and review again, see how we're doing on the second portion. And uh, if you could log back on to Socrative uh, to the classroom and let's take a little quiz really quick. Okay, moving on to numbers. We have the prefix, we start with mono. Mono means one or single. We have a monocyte, which is one cell. A monocyte is actually a type of white blood cell or leukocyte. We have monocytosis, which is a condition of the increase in monocytes. We have mononucleosis, which is a viral infection that can cause uh, damage to the liver. It's indicated by an abnormally high monocyte, monocyte count. Uh, mono is commonly known as the kissing disease. Uh, it used to be back in the day it thought that a lot of high school kids would get mono and it would take you out for like two or three weeks. You'd be down sick with flu-like symptoms. Uh, mono is actually caused by the EB or Epstein-Barr virus, uh, in case you were wondering. More examples for the prefix mono, we have mononuclear cell, and that is a cell that has one nucleus. 
A monograph is a written study of a single subject. Monomania is a preoccupation with one subject only. Uh, uh, monoma is one tumor. Monomyoplegia is paralysis of one muscle. Mononeural is pertaining to one nerve. The next one is multi. Multi means many or more than one. You have adjectives that mean um, something has many. So multicapsular is uh, many capsules. Multiglandular is glands or plural form of gland. Uh, multinuclear would be nuclei uh, is the plural form of nucleus. And so that would mean that there are more than one uh, nucleus or nuclei in a cell. Okay, terms with para. Uh, para means live birth. It's used in words to indicate the number of times a woman has given birth. So a multiparous is the ejectable form. Examples include multipara is more than one child. For example, multiple births or twins. Uh, nullipara is no live births. Prima para is the first live birth. So those are important to know, especially if you're going to go into an OBGYN or gen uh, family practice, then you would want to know how to document those, and I'll show you how in just a couple of slides how we chart those. Para, uh, the whole word suffix and prefix, it can be used in multiple um, different ways. So we use the word para usually to indicate the number of times a woman has given birth. That's important. It's not the number of times she's pregnant. It is not the number of times she's had an abortion, whether spontaneous or voluntary. It is the number of times she has given birth. So you want to write the number, para, write para, and then the number. For example, para 2 or para 4. That would indicate that this woman in example 1 has given birth twice and the woman in example 2 has given birth four times. Gravida then is the number of pregnancies. So um, gravida in Latin terms means heavy or weighted down. Prima gravida is the first pregnancy. So if a woman is in for her first pregnancy, then she would be prima gravida. After that, uh, each pregnancy is counted as gravida as well. So for charting purposes, for example here, four pregnancies, two live births, and two spontaneous abortions would be charted as gravida four. So that's the four pregnancies. Uh, AB for abortion two and para two. So she that shows that she was pregnant four times, had two abortions, and two live births. Or G4 for gravita four, AB2, and then P2. Okay, more numeric prefixes. Um, you have deca and deci. Deca is used in words that mean 10. So a decaliter would be 10 liters. Deci is used in words to mean one-tenth, so it's very easy to confuse these and it's important to not confuse them. Um, when you get to the part where you do dosage calculations, if you ever take a class where you have to do dosage calculations, uh, you will have to know the difference between deca and deci, and you will learn very quickly that you can overdose a patient significantly if you do not know the difference in these prefixes that we're going to go through in the next few slides. Um, so again, deca is 10, deci, one-tenth. Um, so a decaliter would be 10 liters. A deciliter would be one-tenth of a liter. Kilo is used in words to mean 1,000. A kilometer is 1,000 meters. A kilogram is 1,000 grams. Okay, so next is milli. Milli is used in words to mean 1,000th. Uh, millimeter is one thousandth of a meter, so one thousand millimeters would equal one whole meter. Uh, a milligram is one thousandth of a gram. So there's a couple pictures here that show you um, one milligram, kind of in comparison. There, this little yellow pill is about five milligrams. All of this together will be about a gram of medication. Okay, hecto is used in words to mean 100. For example, a hectometer is 100 meters, a hectogram is 100 grams. 
And so this chart down here, um, I know it's probably a little bit difficult to see, but this chart down here, I am trying to see if I can make it bigger. I don't know if I can. Oh, I did. Hey, look at that. Um, so this chart I use when I teach dosage calculations, and I use this to help teach my students how to do conversions um, between the metric system because it's kind of hard to do sometimes. If you're good with math, you can do the divide and multiply by you know multiples of 10 if not then this kind of helps so but to give you for this lecture an idea of how it works if you have a meter gram or a liter in the middle deci centi milli and then micro over here are all smaller than your base unit of gram meter uh, and liter deca would be 10 times a meter hecto will be a hundred times a meter and kilo will be a thousand meters. Deci would be one tenth, one hundredth, one thousandth, and then this um, is what? A hundred thousand, ten thousand, a hundred, hundred thousandth, I think a micro is something crazy, crazy small. And then down here, um, this kind of shows you what how the numbers play out so in this number here one million five hundred thousand three hundred and twenty and then twelve uh point zero one two the one is in the millions place the five is in the hundred thousands uh this is the ten thousand thousand so if you think of this in dollars it's kind of a little bit easier to think of and then back here this would be the tenth place just where the number of dimes you have would go um, this is the one hundredths place where the one is, which would be the number of pennies you have, and then behind that would be the thousands. All right. Let me figure out how to get that back down there. Got it. Okay. Uh, centi is used in words to mean one hundredth. A centimeter is one hundredth of a meter. A centigram is one hundredth of a gram. So just kind of like I showed you in the picture before. A cubic centimeter is a cc, and you'll see that a lot um, in the health field. This um, is a volume of measurement frequently used when giving injections. And it uh, is an amount that equals the space occupied by one centimeter cubed. Medications are sometimes expressed in fractions of a cc, uh, and ccs sometimes are also called mils or milliliters. Um, and that is abbreviated with a small m and a capital L. So here's a picture of a 5 mil or a 5 cc syringe for you. Okay, log back onto the classroom. We'll review this section real quick. Okay, next up we have prefixes of direction. Um, we have ab, which means from or away from. D, which is also from down from or from and resulting in less like deduct is to take away from or result in less and then lastly x which also means from uh, and the sense of direction there is out from so again ab is away from examples include abduction which is away from the midline abnormal which would be away from normal aberrant which is wandering away from the normal course, aberral, which is away from the mouth, and ab irritant, which is something that takes away the irritation. More prefixes with ab, or excuse me, more words with the prefix ab. We have ab lactation, which is taking the baby away from breastfeeding or cessation of the um, secretion of breast milk, ablation, which is surgical removal of body tissue, a braid, which is to scrape the skin away, an abrasion, which is an injury involving scraping away of skin, and then lastly, abortion, which is the termination of pregnancy. So uh, spontaneous abortion is a naturally occurring termination of the pregnancy, and that is more commonly known as a miscarriage. In medical terminology, uh, miscarriage is termed as an abortion. You need to be very careful when we're talking about that um, in front of patients though because um, most of the time it's offensive to a woman who has miscarried 
to tell her that her body has aborted her child. So you just want to be sensitive of using that word. Okay, so the next prefix is D, which is down from. Deciduous means pertaining, or excuse me, pertains to falling off or shedding. Deciduous teeth are the primary teeth that fall out during childhood. Those are more commonly known as your baby teeth. Uh, descending nerve tract is one tr uh, the tract that comes down from the brain. And so they have a, a picture here that shows you a descending nerve tract. Examples include dehydration, which is the act of taking water from a wet substance. Uh, body dehydration can be caused by vomiting, diarrhea, high fever. Um, dehydrated is a state of having less water than before. And so um, a lot of times when I think of dehydrated, for some reason I think of um, beef jerky because beef jerky is basically dehydrated beef. Uh, it's beef that was hydrated and then it's not dehydrated and they make it into jerky. So to give you kind of a visual of uh, something having less water than it had before. Just think of beef jerky as disgusting as that is. Uh, decalcification is the removal of calcium from bones and this can be caused by insufficient calcium intake during pregnancy and also inadequate vitamin D. Vitamin D controls calcium metabolism so if you don't have enough vitamin D then you're gonna have calcium issues um, subsequently. And this can result in osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. So it's important to have uh, a sufficient calcium intake and then also a vitamin D intake as well. Um, sorry, I had to take a break there for a second and messed up the slide. Okay, so the next prefix is X. That means out from. So excised would mean to cut out and remove apart. Excised would be the past tense of excise. An extraction is a procedure in which something is pulled out. Excretion is the process of expelling a substance from the body. Usually refers to waste substances, so um, like excrement uh, would be stool usually. Uh, excretion of carbon dioxide would be respiratory excretion. A sweat would be dermal excretion. Menses would be menstrual, menstrual excretions. Extend is to straighten or lengthen. Extension is straightening or lengthening. So flexion is the bending or shortening. Um, with muscles, relaxing results in extension and contracting results in flexion. So you flex your muscles or you relax them and extend them. The next term is ISO and that is equal or same. Isotonic is having the same osmotic pressure as red blood cells and will not destroy them. Um, for example, normal saline or intravenous glucose. So we have isotonic solutions that we can put in IV um, and that will not destroy the um, red blood cells in the bloodstream and so it kind of helps um, put some substance back in uh, without destroying what's existing. Hypertonic is uh, having higher osmotic pressure than red blood cells. Hyperto hypotonic is having lower osmotic pressure. Isometric is of equal dimensions. Isocellular is composed of cells of the same size. Isodactylism, our fingers or toes of equal length. Isothermal is pertaining to equal temperature. Okay, so the movement of matter, you've got two things you need to know here. You have diffusion um, and osmosis. Diffusion is the intermingling of substances by the natural movement of their particles. So basically what's happening here in this first picture is uh, you have a beaker of water and they are putting in dye into this beaker of water and eventually that dye will spread naturally through the water and tint the water. And that's kind of how diffu diffusion works. Osmosis is a little bit different. It's the movement of particles through a semi-permeable membrane until the level of concentration is equal. And so you have um, the semi-permeable membrane. And what that means is that it's selective. Uh, only certain things are gonna get through this membrane. 
And what happens is it allows certain things through until the pressure is equal on both sides of the membrane. Filtration is the filtering to remove solid particles. And so if you think of a, let me think, think of a coffee filter, like a coffee filter. If you, if you make a pot of coffee in the morning, you put your coffee grounds in a filter and run the water through the machine and the water goes through the grounds and the filter catches the grounds but allows the water to filter through, right? And so that allows the um, concentrated portion of the water to accumulate in the cup, which ends up being coffee, which picked up all of the stuff from the grounds, but the grounds with the solid particles stayed in the filter. And that's kind of how filtration works. It, it removes all of the solid particles from a liquid. Okay, the next term is aniso, and that is the combining form for unequal. Anisocytosis is a condition with cells of unequal size. So normal red blood cells are all about the same size. Uh, anisocytosis is where red blood cells are not the same size. And the usual cause for that is unhealthy bone marrow, which is typically not a good thing. Um, usually when we have uh, anisocytosis, it's a marker for a larger disease process that's in development. Okay, terms with masto. Masto is the combining form for breast. Examples include anisomastia, and that is unequal size of women's breasts. Uh, women's breasts typically are unequal sized. It is very uncommon for women to have asymmetrical to have symmetrical breasts. They are typically um, asymmetrical. However, with anisomastia, it is um, quite a substantial difference. With mastocarcinoma, it is a cancerous tumor of the breast. With a mastectomy, it is an excision of all or part of the breast. Um, there are two types of mastectomies. There's radical and simple. Um, and uh, the picture here shows you the before and after of a, well, the after of a mastectomy. And so obviously um, it would be her right breast is still intact but her left breast, she has had a mastectomy on. And so what they do is open it up and take out all of the breast tissue, and then that's what you're left with. All right, so prefixes of place. You have dia, per, peri, and circum that we're gonna go through. All of those mean through or around. Dia and, and per mean through. Carry and circum mean around. Peri means around. Periarticular means around uh, articulations and joints. Peritonsillar would mean around the tonsil. Pericolic would be around the colon. Perichondral would mean around cartilage. Periodontal would be pertaining to diseases of the support structures around teeth. Pericardectomy would be an excision of tissue around the heart. Um, and so that tissue around the heart is actually called the pericardium. Um, and so they would be excising tissue from the pericardium. Circum means around also. And so circumduction would be moving around in a circular motion. So if you stick your arm out straight and move it around in circles, that is circumduction. Circumocular would mean around the eyes. Circumoral is around the mouth. Circumcision means to cut around, and that is a surgical removal uh, of the foreskin of the penis. And so they cut around the head of the penis or the glands penis and remove the excess foreskin. Circumscribed is limited in space as if the line is drawn around it. Uh, circumscribed lesions are skin lesions that are limited in space that they cover. For example, boils, pimples, or pustules. They usually do not, um, if you've ever seen a boil or a pimple or a pustule, I'm sure you have at some point in your life at least seen a pimple, um, you know that they don't end up growing um, exorbitantly and spread all over the whole entire face or a whole entire area. They usually have a circumscribed um, area, so they're limited in the space that they can grow in. 
Dia means through. Diagnosis uh, means knowing through. Diathermy is heating through. Diarrhea, flowing through. Diuretic is a substance that causes an increase in urine output. Diuresis is the process of causing urine to flow more rapidly. Esis is the su suffix meaning action or process. So diaphoresis is the action of profuse sweating. Um, and sometimes they are given a diaphoretic. Uh, arthrodesis is the action of immobilizing a joint. Hematopoiesis is the process of forming blood. So it's an action or process involving something. Per means through, so perforated is the objectable form. Perforate means to make a hole through something. Perforation is a puncture or hole through something. A perforated ulcer is an ulcer that has eaten a hole through the stomach wall. So here's a nice little picture for you of a, uh, an ulcer down here. It has eaten through um, the stomach wall, so that's a good time. Looks painful. Percussion means striking through, and that involves tapping on a surface to determine the underlying conditions. So sometimes you will um, have doctors that will tap on your belly, and that would be percussion. They are tapping on your belly, the surface of your belly, to, under, to determine underlying conditions. Perfusion is supplying tissues with oxygen and nutrients through blood supply or other tissue fluids. Perfusate is the objectable form, and perfuse is the verb form of perfusion. Uh, the next term, necro, is the combining form for death. The origin, uh, the Greek meaning is necros, is corpse. So necrosis is a condition when dead tissue surrounded by healthy tissue. So you have tissue that is dead and it's surrounded by living viable tissue. Um, this is typically caused by loss of blood supply and then gangrene sets in and that um, results in a localized death of tissue. The term necrotic means pertaining to dead tissue. So necro is dead um, and you know, uh, ick means pertaining to, so you've got necrotic, which would be pertaining to dead tissue. Um, examples with necro, ooh, we've got some fun pictures here for you. We have, uh, see the maggots up here? Sometimes they will um, intentionally introduce maggots to wounds to help uh, debride it of necrotic tissue because maggots eat everything. Uh, debridement of necrotic tissue is a treatment for severe, severe burns. Debridement is the removal of damaged tissue. Necrectomy is the excision of dead tissue. Necrophobia is an abnormal fear of dead bodies. Necrophilia which is probably more disturbing than necrophobia, is an abnormal or unusual attraction to dead bodies. That's a problem. Uh, Post-mortem examinations is an examination that occurs of the body after death. There are various terms for this procedure depending on if you are applying it to humans or animals. Uh, autopsy happens on humans. We do autopsies on humans. A necropsy uh, usually is performed on animals, sometimes it will be done on humans. Uh, a necro necroscopy is done on animals um, or other non-humans. However, this uh, necroscopy is sometimes used interchangeably as well. So any of these things, terms you can hear on post-mortem exams. However, uh, autopsy is the one that you'll hear most commonly. And here is a picture of an autopsy in progress. And so what they do is they cut a Y, they take out all of the um, uh, organs out of the body cavity. And sometimes if they're doing uh, an autopsy on the brain, then they'll, they'll cut off the top of the skull and um, extract the brain. And then they examine all the tissues and they weigh all the organs and they do all kinds of fun stuff. And then uh, that's pretty much it. Sew them back up and send them to the funeral home. 
Uh, so some suffixes with phobia and or excuse me some uh, fears and uh, abnormal attractions which would be phobias and philias. Uh, the abnormal fear of dead bodies would be necrophobia. Abnormal attraction would be necrophilia. It's weird. Uh, abnormal fear of water is hydrophobia. And then abnormal attraction would be hydrophilia. Abnormal fear of fire is pyrophobia. Abnormal attraction would be pyrophilia. Abnormal fear of air would be aerophobia. Abnormal attraction to air, if you have such a thing, would be aerophilia. Uh, an abnormal fear of self would be autophobia, and abnormal attraction to oneself would be autophilia. Uh, for medterm, an abnormal fear would be medtermophobia. An abnormal attraction, this is a joke. Nobody has an abnormal attraction to medterm. <laughs> it's just a joke. There is no such word. That's totally made up. We're funny. We've got jokes over here in the department all right back to Socrative. we'll review this last section and then uh, that's it for chapter 10